Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're tuning in from. My name is Samantha Becker, and I'm with uh, Arizona State University's University Technology Office, or UTO, and I'm really excited to welcome you all to today's episode of Shaping EDU Live, all about personalizing learning. Um, and if I could really quickly, before I dive in, ask anyone who's not speaking at the moment to mute their mics to avoid um, any ambient noises, cats meowing, dogs barking, whatever it is, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Um, we have a panel of experts here with us today, and also an audience of experts here with us today. And so we're going to have some interesting conversations around personalized learning. And the format we're taking here is very much in embodying the Shaping EDU spirit. We're going to look about dreaming around personalized learning, doing personalized learning, and driving personalized learning at scale. Um, there's going to be a number of questions that we're going to try and address between the three panelists. No doubt you guys will, in the audience will have questions yourselves, so keep them coming in the chat. Um, another thing I wanted to share is at these events, the discussions are so lively and exciting that we often don't have time to get to all the questions that we set out to address as a, pan as a panel ahead of time. So all the questions that we want to address have been posted in Shaping EDU's online community, and I'll, post, I'll repost that link here in a minute. And as you're you know, listening to the panelists, be thinking about your perspectives and how you would answer those questions, and we invite you to submit your thoughts and responses um, as a comment in the discussion thread in our online community. Um, before we dive in and, and introduce the panelists, the, uh, the panelists introduce themselves, um, I just want to say that um, the Shaping EDU um, website is shapingedu.asu.edu. So if you're looking for resources and recordings and what's coming next, you could visit that website. Um, we are planning another Shaping EDU live event in January, at the end of January, and we'll be sharing um, the date when that has been pinpointed. Um, and um, we're, we invite anyone who's not yet in our online community to, um, to jump in. Um, feel free to also follow along on Twitter with hashtag Shaping EDU, and our, our own Twitter handle is at Shaping EDU, so easy to remember. Um, and for those of you wondering if I purposely wore this shirt to match the Shaping EDU Live logo, you're right. <laughs> Thank you so much for noticing. Um, really excited to get started here. We have a diverse panel of experts, and because they could in each introduce themselves way better than I can from reading off of a bio, I'm just going to go around and ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, share where they're coming from, and their own connection to personalized learning. We'll start with you first, Heather. Hey, okay. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Heather McCullough. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and I'm the Associate Director for our Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, Charlotte, UNC Charlotte's an urban research university, and we have just under 30,000 students. So um, the center that I'm at provides professional development support for our faculty members and support of our university's teaching mission. So the, the focus that I'll have today is really talking about how we're supporting our faculty members in adaptive learning and I'll say that uh, we are just beginning a pilot or we are, we're currently supporting a pilot of adaptive learning where we have nine courses that are using uh, four different uh, adaptive learning platforms and tools and the focus of our pilot um, is looking at gateway and progression courses primarily in STEM disciplines and so our roles really range here with what we're doing um, providing instructional design to technical support and some coordination over the projects for these uh, varied tools um, I do want to put a plug in we are hosting a digital learning forum on February 8th and we have a very esteemed keynote speaker and that would be Dale Johnson who is also here with us today so we wanted to invite anybody who's in the area close by um, who would like to come. It's a free event who would like to come and join us. The information is on our website at teaching.uncc.edu. Thank you so much, Heather. Over to you, Megan. Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Lignos. I'm with a University of California, Irvine. Um, my role there is the Director of Learning Experience Design and Online Education under the uh, 
division of teaching excellence and innovation is under the vice provost level kind of uh, structure. Um, this is a very uh, exciting topic to me. When I think about personalized learning, I cannot help but um, think about 20, 25 years ago, I, um, I started a school teaching English as a second language. And all these kids coming in with their parents, they all come with a very different level of English uh, learning. So some people, some kids may come in without any um, knowledge of English, no alphabets, nothing. And some people may um, come here with some of the basic conversation. So it was kind of a challenge at the time to to group them um, into an effective learning class experience. So we kind of do a very low tech personalized learning by um, give a pre-assessment and really think about how you group this uh, similar level of student into a group and then you can start the class together. So um, later on, um, every time they go home, they, they, they would bring, uh, they would take a, a a cassette tape with them and there's a lot of curriculum it's like the content when i really think about it you know they take this cassette tape there's a song there's stories and they will listen uh, in between the class to keep them engaged so uh, when i apply that experience to today's um personalized learning in higher education where i serve um, I thought all these basic components are very similar. You know, the, the key is I actually brought some questions for everybody to think about besides those main questions. It's really, you know, um, this personalized learning always has to be involved uh, with the isolated learning process. Or as an educator, how can we enhance this personalized learning, the value, but really it embedded into a learning collaboration, learning community. So they actually learn on their own, but somehow there's an opportunity for them to share and showcase. Another question I have is that does technology actually facilitate or limit, dominate the learning experience? Um, when you think about personalized learning, a lot of the state education really um, see there's a value to integrate this in there. But at the same time, you know, uh, if you think about technology platform, it's very linear. So how can we, um, how can we design a learning experience, utilize these technology and not limit uh, students' learning experience by, you know, a preset of process? I think that that's an innovation that we can definitely explore in the future. And my uh, last question is that, um, how does the curriculum and learning advance advancement can be designed to embrace learning flexibility. Um, because uh, when I think about implementing um, personalized learning in the, uh, in the college I serve, you know, there's always fixed terms. So there's always 10 weeks a quarter. So um, when you think about personalized learning, you really want to uh, give the learner as much flexibility as possible so they can actually have a, this more self-paced kind of experience. However, how do you deal with this fixed turn at the same time, embedded self-paced uh, self um, kind of uh, uh, process? I think that's, that's another way that we can really design uh, it uh, innovatively. So that's my little um, quick uh, intro about my interest in this area and I look forward to explore more with you today. Thanks so much, Megan. Over to you, Dale. Hi, everybody. I'm Dale Johnson. I'm the Adaptive Program Manager at Arizona State University, and I've been here for about six years. We've been working on the challenge of mass personalization. I think about all of the aspects of our life today. In the last 20 years, we've moved from mass production to mass personalization whether you're talking about entertainment or you're talking about healthcare or you're talking about other industries, transportation, we're, we're moving to mass personalization in education. And the challenge before us is how do we do that effectively? And picking up on what Megan was saying, how do we make this a more personal experience rather than an impersonal experience through the technology? Well said, um, very much in, in that vein too. And I think, Inherently, you guys address parts of this, 
But the elephant in the room, or perhaps we'll call it the, the tortoise in the room, is defining personalized learning. I'm saying tortoise in the room because I almost feel like the semantics and discussions around definitions have been happening for over, for over 100 years. Um, but I'd love to hear from each of you in terms of you know, understanding the dream of personalized learning, how you personally define it in your environment. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think of personalized learning as the umbrella that over uh, sees a number of options for delivering personalization. We have the historical model, and I think this is what you were referring to, Sam, uh, of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. If we go back to the English model of education at Oxford and Cambridge, they could afford to provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring, so you had personalization, but there was no scale. Today, what we're trying to do under that personalization umbrella, in addition to tutoring, we're trying to use adaptive courseware as another technique to get to the personalization. And what that means for us is we are trying to deliver the right lesson to the right student at the right time. That is easy to say and hard to do. So I think most of the conversation today will be around how do we do that effectively. Awesome, other perspectives. Sorry, I was trying to get to my microphone. I think um, I loved Megan's example of teaching uh, ESL, and I think certainly um, my background is as a language instructor as well. And I think um, when I think about personalized learning and the, and the power and potential for personalized learning, uh, we just had Barb Oakley come and speak with us, and uh, she spoke on the topic of uh, learning how to learn. And for me, it seems like using these personalized tools can really, if they're if they're done well and in a structured and um, in a structured way and thoughtful way, they can they can help the students understand how they are learning and where they have weaknesses or where they have areas that they need to address and, and feel empowered and have uh, tools there to address those areas of, of um, lack or weakness or, or areas that they need to, to build on. So for me, in addition to the kind of mass personalization um, is, is also helping the students understand themselves as learners and as individualized learners and um, finding ways to, um, to build on that and to become lifelong learners through uh, new tools and more expansive tools that are made available to them. And certainly, I know we're gonna get to the conversation about the role of instructional design and, and thoughtful um, and deliberate construction of the lessons that would be using um, the personalized learning. But for me, that's it's all part and parcel, so I think the power of these tools to help our students at their moment of need, but also to help our students become more reflective learners themselves is something that I see as a real potential. Megan, what about you? How do you define personalized learning? Sure. Um, when I think about personalized learning, I think it's a way to really empower learners to own their own learning. So they feel more um, engaged with what they actually learn and feel like the motivation to learn. And uh, one way I think about how it can be really well blended into the current situation or current uh, education structure is that it could serve as a wonderful bridge in between the um, the traditional classroom format. So it's actually a hybrid format that you can use that as a flip opportunity. At the same time, um, I also think that when you think about personalized learning, you cannot um, um, stop thinking about the power of um, socialized learning, uh, learning collaboration. So how do you um, embrace this value of personalized learning and not um, minimize the learning collaboration. Uh, that could be something very interesting to think about. So I thought about one way we can do this is actually allow students to have a personalized learning opportunity in between the uh, traditional class um, uh, 
meeting time or or allow them to really learn it on their own to prepare for sharing for network for exchange with with other classmates so for me that's what i think personalized learning can be utilized at the same time i also agree with dale that i think how do we scale that maybe we can build some sort of uh, little personalized learning uh, modules or some sort of uh, library so faculty can actually pick and choose um, the pieces and customize into that that learning experience that could be a very interesting model too thank you Megan and I should really quickly add that Megan is in Taiwan right now and so we're so thankful <laughs> that you are able to join us at the uh, odd hour that it is over there so much appreciated um, I just had to apologize I'm trying to keep myself to be awake so if I kind of start mumbling <laughs> that's probably why <laughs> not at all you're, you're do, doing great so as we're still in the dream segment you know the dream of personalized learning um, before we move on to doing I'd love to ask the panelists, and I think some of this has been addressed in pieces, but what is, in, in your definitions, what is personalized learning good for, but what is it not good for? What should we be avoiding? That's a great question. And I, um, some of the uh, comments here have already pointed out, and I'm, I'm reading some of the comments that are coming in on chat about the socialization, and I think, Personalized learning is uh, wonderful in providing um, specific and unique feedback to students at their point of need, but then to be able to incorporate that back into, you don't want to let students just, um, just go with it. The personalized learning platform is not the course itself. It's not the, the full learning experience. It is, it, it's a tool. It's an additional resource for students and for instructors, I should say, that give the instructors feedback on how students are progressing or where they might be having some difficulties. But then I think the, um, the value, and it's, it's not an easy, um, not necessarily easy, but what do you do with that information as an instructor? So, you know, the student has a tool to kind of go deep in something or, or get help in something that they need help with, but then how do you pull that back and stitch that together so that there is the social, um, the social learning and then that it's a part of the student's full learning experience. It's, it's you know, the, the platform itself, it's uh, not plug and play. You don't just give the student their platform and say, okay, we'll see you in, you know, 15 weeks or 14 weeks or whatever semester, but how do you actually incorporate that into the full, um, the full learning experience and timeline of the course or the, the learning session that you might have. So I think that is something that's, um, that it's not good for. It's not meant to be uh, a, a full course to itself, but it's definitely um, an additional tool for the faculty member as well as for the student. I hope that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, we feel the same way. I mean, at Arizona State, we're using personalized learning technology to liberate us from the lecture. We want to get away from the mass production model where you teach the same lesson to all students at the same time. In order to do that, you need to be able to have the, the students come to class already knowledgeable about what you want to work on. And once you've freed everyone from the lecture, then you can do all kinds of exciting things with active learning. Uh, you can do things with small group engagement. You can increase the level of social contact in the classroom so it's not just one person standing in front of a group and talking for 50 minutes. And there's a lot of value in that. We found that the social networks that we can build within the classroom are so valuable to helping students make it through the course. So the personalized learning technology just frees us up to do more. Yeah, and just, this is great. In the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna move along to our next segment. We've kind of discussed the dream of personalized learning. Um, next is time to discuss how this vision uh, that the panelists have laid out for personalized learning can be achieved. And the first question I wanna ask about that, I actually would like to specifically direct to Heather and other panelists, I want to hear your thoughts afterwards, but what do you see as the role of faculty in the learning process around personalized learning? I had to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much for that question. And I'm actually reading Marilyn's comment right here around learning outcomes. And so uh, the role of faculty and the role of um, 
instructional designers and an instructional design team, I think, is, um, is really essential. And that um, using personalized learning, like Marilyn suggests, that you have to know your um, learning outcomes, your learning objectives beforehand. And you have to have um, a very clear understanding of where you're going and the stages of where you're, you want your students to go. And so one of the things that we've been doing, we're, again, we're early in our stage of, uh, in our pilot, working with um, adaptive learning, but each of our instructional designers who's working with our faculty members in various disciplines, like we've been asking the faculty members to, um, to define their learning objectives, and that sounds so simple, and it's not always simple, and it might be something that is um, for faculty members who are not used to starting at the end like that and being very deliberate in their course mapping um, can be a challenge. And so I would say with a faculty member and with an instructional design team, um, working very carefully to, to not just sketch, but to, but to define and structure what the learning um, objectives are and what each module should look like so that the students know um, if they're progressing or not progressing along the path. And so um, as, as our instructional designers are, are working with our faculty members, I think it's very eye-opening, especially for our faculty members to, um, to receive that careful support on, on just crystal clarity for the whole course of learning objectives at the course level, but also at the module level. We had actually um, realize that and, and develop some tools that have been very effective for us in um, giving guidance to our faculty members and developing course objectives. We have it now a five week, uh, sorry, five day fully online course, it takes one week, um, that walks our faculty members through how to write learning objectives. And again, um, while it sounds so basic, it's, it's really not. And um, so we ask our faculty members to do this uh, this uh, five-day workshop, and I would say that workshop is available freely in the Canvas Commons for anybody who might like to use it or to borrow it. Um, and it's also available for folks who don't use Canvas but like, might like to see the content. And so um, the faculty role in defining, you know, where are we going um, and at each stage, I think, is, is really essential. So we have all of the tools that are out there, but um, you know, in this particular course, what are those goals? If I can um, add more with what Heather was saying, um, I think it's very critical for us to facilitate faculty to see them from being the source of knowledge to learning facilitator. Um, I think K-12 may do a better job than hiring it. Most of the faculty still see themselves as the source of knowledge and not realize that right now, really, we need to guide students with a, some sort of learning pathway versus providing content. So um, they, they just love their content. Faculty love their content. So they just want to create these lectures. So how do we shift them from that kind of mindset, I think maybe is the first step of implementing personalized learning, in, at least for higher education. Yeah. And I see Sune and the uh, chat has said something about, uh, has made a really nice comment about uh, thinking of personalized learning almost in a reverse design sense. Certainly, I think you have to, to think about how you structure your, um, uh, your course from a re reverse design sense. Like where, where do we want to go? And knowing where we want to go, how do we structure the paths so that our students can get there? Um, and it sounds like they have a very successful science entrepreneurship set where, that they have done in that way. So that's sort of our thinking too, uh, Sune. Awesome. And I, yeah. I'm seeing in the chat, uh, Dale has said something about adaptive systems. So Dale, if you want to um, respond to the question that Heather and Megan addressed, but also then I want to hear personally your take on how you create or configure systems to do it. Um, yeah. would love to hear that. So Heather's done a great job of summarizing the hard work of the faculty. We think of faculties as leading the entire process. Every one of these steps, whether you're developing, implementing, or teaching, is going to be dependent upon great faculty. So when you're working on building an adaptive system, 
the faculty have to make the decisions about learning objectives, instructional resources, assessment activities, put those all together in a lesson format that enables the student to go through and learn the material. Then once they get to class, they can use that knowledge to apply it to specific problems. So we focus on the faculty member as a leader in the classroom, not lecturer, and they spend their time challenging the students to think more deeply about the particular lessons that week. Uh, that usually takes a form of a problem-based learning exercise or some kind of active learning, uh, think, pair, share work. Uh, all of these things are pretty well developed and there's a lot of great learning science on doing this well in the classroom. So I encourage people to think about personalized learning as just the cornerstone of a transformation in the pedagogy. It has so many opportunities that were unavailable five or, or 15 years ago uh, that we can take advantage of today. Awesome. Oh, I want to oh. add one quick thing if I can. Sorry, Samantha. Um, um, the idea of faculty members at the center, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing certainly is the partnerships that are involved between the faculty members and our platform providers, as well as our um, instructional designers. We had um, Karen Vignare from APLU come and speak with us. And I remember her saying that the part partners that she came last year, she, the partnerships between the instructional designers and the faculty members and the, and the platform providers will necessarily be um, tighter and more dynamic maybe than any other kind of endeavor that we had worked on before. And now that we're kind of um, in the beginning stages of our pilot, I see exactly what she means. And so it, it's the collaboration between the groups that are involved in um, developing and providing and customizing the platform based on uh, the faculty members' vision. It's certainly, it is different and it's more, um, more dynamic, I think, than I have experienced before. This is great, and this, this is a good lead-in for our next question in the vein of dreaming and then doing. Um, talk to me about the creation and configuration of these systems, especially with regards to adaptive and, and courseware, and talk to me about how you, to think about successfully implementing them. I think Heather went through most of that already. I, I think it's a lot harder than people imagine. That's the challenge we face. We've built a dozen different courses over the last six years. And inevitably, three months in, the faculty comment about how tough this is. So as you start to build a team to work on a new model of uh, personalization using an adaptive courseware or some other technology, you have to prepare them for the long haul. These are marathon projects. My experience is it takes three times through a course before you get to a high performance level. So as a faculty member develops the new course, their first iteration can be a little shaky. They learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Does the technology support them or not? Then they go through a revision process. Second time, they get their sea legs. They start to feel better. By the third time through it, they're really expert at both the technology and the pedagogy. So you have to give them the time to go through that process. You can't simply say, we're gonna try this one semester and then it's over because that's never gonna be successful in a, a learning process that requires them to transform everything that they've done in the past. I will echo what Dale was saying. Um, I think it's really important that we provide a very practical, expectation on the faculty's mind because this could sound a little scary like I said they're very used to, to present content versus become a learning facilitator but at the same time I also think the course alignment is very important because when you think about personalized learning you really try to design a, a, a learning pathway and uh, again if the faculty is still defining how the learning pathway of the staff is supposed to be, and if that's the case, you know, what kind of question will be very good to ask students, and, you know, what kind of assessment, 
you know, ask those questions in the assessment to really help us to evaluate their their level. I think those things, that's why it's very complicated because it's not just one way. There's so many because learning it, it, it is not, it's not linear. So at the same time, you need to think about this kind of spiral learning kind of concept. And, but how do you really fit that into the personalized learning model, which is kind of interesting. So. Oh, this is great. Um, and in the interest of time, I want to, you know, we have a, a few more questions in the do, the doing portion of our discussion today. Um, and I'm actually going to combine uh, two of the questions we we're hoping to address. And again, these questions are posted in our online community. So feel free. We'd love for you to share your take, everyone in the audience, now or later. Um, so what will it take to achieve this vision in kind of some distinct or are they distinct uh, settings, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online learning contexts? And as we kind of discuss this area, uh, let us know if there are any initial research, projects, pilots, programs, really exemplars that show this vision in progress. Yeah, I was just adding that to the chat. I'll talk a little bit about our college algebra course. In fall of 2016, after a five-year effort to improve the results in college algebra, we shifted our approach to ALEX, which is the McGraw-Hill personalized math program. And we did really four things with this. One was we adopted ALEX. The second was we got rid of developmental math. We used to have a developmental math course. So we got rid of that and we integrated that curriculum into the college algebra program through ALEX. Third thing we did was we added more instructional assistance in the classroom so that the faculty had more eyes and ears. And the fourth thing was we integrated all of our instructional content, that is OpenStax textbook and 300 videos that we had produced over the years into Alex. So by doing those four things, we created an ASU version of that system. And since then, what we found is the results have been dramatically improved. We, we had a 20 percentage point gain in our student success rate. That's a grade of C or better. And now we've, that was the first fall 16. Since then, fall 17 was even better. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results from this semester, fall of 18. What we like to say is, and a faculty member coined this phrase, she used to teach one class to 100 students. Now she teaches 100 students individually through this technology. And they have three meetings a week, so they get together in the classroom in an emporium model. So the faculty member has a lot of contact. She gets to know all of those students well through this uh, model. So it's not an impersonal or inhumane system. It's much more oriented towards helping each student progress at a, at a rate that's gonna make them successful. Thank you, Dale. Other exemplars, especially with regards to um, you know the, the the interesting mix of face-to-face, -face, online, and hybrid. I'm actually helping a professor, a physics professor, developing a course that involved with adaptive learning concept. So what happened is that we're using one of the vendor tool to to design the content, and sometimes we're we're trying to figure out what would be the best way um, to to introduce this kind of learning concept to students. Do we actually present a content, uh, a certain kind of content first before we start the assessment? Or we want to do a pre-test, just not give them any content, figure out where they are, and kind of put them at different level. So this is still involving, we're still at a very early on stage, but that is one of the questions that you constantly have to um, interact with faculty, figure out what they think is the best for their student. Is that, you know, because like I said earlier, faculty is very uh, connected with their own content. So they're not, somehow you know see the picture so how do we actually um um use i'm just interested about what heather and dale are doing um in terms of working with faculty design that pathway and that will be something i, I i'm just really curious about how other people are doing I, I wish I had an answer for you today, right now, uh, since we're just beginning our, our pilot work or our, our building this semester. 
I don't, but I can tell you that some of the tools that have been very useful to us to get started were certainly the quick framework as we were evaluating, um, you know, platforms to use. So we relied on that really heavily. We looked at other schools, Georgia State. We had Megan Tassine come in and join us early, early on. We uh, tried to do a lot of homework and look to uh, Georgia State, look to ASU certainly to see what was happening. The tools that we're currently using in our pilot include Alex, uh, Realize It, two publisher tools, Macmillan and Pearson as well. So we will have um, information about that. Yeah, thank you, Samantha, for putting that in the um, in the chat. Courseware in Context has a, has a wonderful uh, rubric that we did use and that was uh, very, very helpful for us. But um, anyway, so those are the four tools that we're looking at right now and that are in, like, have been deployed in our classes right now. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, some of our faculty groups uh, appreciated being able to work with the publisher content that might already be a little more structured and, and created and available. And we have other uh, groups who are working with Realize It and um, to, to build out uh, more customized content that they are creating. And they were faculty members who had already been quite comfortable in um, uh, lesson design and in working with the technology and so for them using a tool like realize it that's uh, perhaps a little more open um, made sense for them and other faculty members just felt more comfortable going with the tool provided by their textbook publisher already so um, we will be sharing that information um, at our February event and I assume we'll be putting some things online as well so we'll have um, will have results at that point. I encourage everybody to, to think about a multi-vendor strategy. We, we tried to build a one-size-fits-all model and it failed miserably. And we found multi-vendors much more open to faculty experimentation. So we have a portfolio of seven vendors that we pre-approved and the faculty can select from that portfolio. So they have different publishers, they have startups like Cogbooks to Realize It, Acrobatic. They have uh, a lot of the things that uh, they might want to explore are at their fingertips. So we try not to say no to the faculty around these issues. And the other experience we've had with that is that uh, you're going to find that people will uh, change their mind during the process so you have to be nimble and we've done prototyping in one system and then implementation in another so I always think of this as kind of a risk management challenge like how do you keep uh, enough of your instructional resources and other things organized so if you have to change course in the middle of this process you can do that so think about that flexibility for the faculty uh, giving them the opportunity to experiment and then being able to respond when they do change their mind. One of the things that we did to that effect, I agree, the multi-vendor approach certainly, and we, we learned that from Dale and we learned that from Georgia State. We had um, early on, a year, year ago, um, a vendor fair basically when we had um, Karen Vignari come in and speak and then we had uh, a vendor fair and we invited faculty members in those courses that we knew were target courses for us and anybody who was interested just to come and kick the tires uh, vendors were very willing to do that and we provided space for them and uh, then provided space for for them to do demonstrations but also to have follow-up meetings with our faculty members at our event uh, early next year we're gonna do the same thing so we think allowing the faculty members to really interact with the vendors and to see what is out there um, was was instrumental and and for us. I will say the challenge, and so I'll be curious when Dale comes to visit us and maybe he can help us solve this uh, problem. We'll be um, you know supporting a whole portfolio of vendors, especially knowing what we feel is the benefit that our faculty members get from having close interaction with the instructional designer as well as the instructional design team from the vendors. So. Um, that is something that we're still kind of staring in the face. Yeah, I like to say personalized learning is a team sport. <laughs> you have to change the faculty mindset. If they're used to being solo operators and they've got their history of doing everything themselves in PowerPoint or in a 
Camtasia on their desktop and they, they suddenly are uh, given assistance with instructional designers, video producers, educational technologists, librarians. Sometimes they can be overwhelmed. So you have to build that team spirit from the first day. Really well said. And I actually think this is a great segue to our the final portion of our discussion before we launch into audience questions. And there have been many. So I'm actually only going to ask one question um, from our drive uh, section so that we can get, get to some of these awesome and burning audience questions. And I'm going to combine two of them again. Talk to me in terms of driving personalized learning effectively. Talk to me about the biggest things posing a threat to scale and ideas for overcoming those challenges. Dale? <laughs> yeah, I can, take a, I can take a crack at that. I, I think the lack of good mature systems is the biggest frustration right now. Everything we build is custom in biology, chemistry, physics, economics, psychology. We're even working on a course in philosophy. And it takes a lot of money to do that. So when you start in on this process, you, you find yourself overwhelmed because if you don't have instructional designers or you don't have resources to pay the faculty for summer work, everybody's busy doing other things and it's hard to get their attention. We've been fortunate. We've had great support from our leadership and the academic community. So they've been flexible and they've been able to develop these coursewares. But at some point that has to change. We have to feel like we're working on something together across institutions and it's not just ASU's building a biology course and UNC Charlotte's building a biology course and Georgia State's building a biology course. So that's the next frontier. And the, the second thing that's a huge challenge for us is faculty training. In, in the, uh, the process of learning how to be a, a faculty member, they get very little instruction on learning science or on instructional design or on good pedagogy. So sometimes somebody who's been doing this for 20 years is resistant to those ideas. So I use a lot of learning science to convince them that in addition to their disciplinary expertise, they can learn about other types of science that are valuable to them. And some of them really embrace that. They like the idea that there's a, a learning science discipline and they start to read the literature and they learn more about it. So I always encourage them to put on their research hat and do their work, their homework, so that I'm not giving them a, a bunch of BS. This is all well developed methodologically. They just aren't aware of it. Yeah, and just um, shameless plug because, you know, what you mentioned about ASU doing their work, UNC doing their work, and all this work is happening in different institutions. Um, our online community, and I'll post a link here again in a moment, has now a forum called Mapping EDU. We're actually looking to collect tangible exemplars in various stages. So it could be conception and development, a pilot, a full-on program. Um, and all you need to do to submit your exemplar or personalized learning happening at your institution or elsewhere. Uh, there's a sample post, and actually Alex Pickett in the audience has got us started with, with a few submissions as well. Post your exemplars of personalized learning, and we're going to be um, you know, working on an effort to kind of centralize all those examples somewhere along with contact details for who you can reach out to to learn more uh, about how it all came together. Anyone else want to address the, the question of, of threat to scale? Um, I just feel like uh, what Dale's saying, you know, building each course can take a lot of the time, a lot of resources. And sometimes you wonder how wonderful if there's a way, um, um, there's a platform that everybody builds, uh, the, the, the content can be shared. You know, a little bit like the open initiatives. So um, right now, since this is such a, a new concept and new pedagogy, um, like to, uh, both Heather and Dale saying that they use multiple platforms and different vendors to, to deliver based on different faculty's need. And I'm hoping in the future, one day there's some sort of uniformity can be agreed by these vendors. So you don't really tie it in with, you know, because everything is super customized. So it's very hard to scale. So I guess the future thinking will be, how can we, um, how can we take advantage of these hard, Build, um, hard effort building this wonderful course and 
could be could be utilized in different way, can be repurposed at different university, and that that could be a very wonderful thing. So, well said. Uh, any concluding thoughts around this theme, Heather? Well, I was gonna just say that I think. Um, not to underestimate the, the value in this regard of uh, support from the highest levels of leadership at, at institutions and, uh, and you know, uh, institutions beyond just universities. I think, um, you know, I know the Horizon Report uh, pointed out that chief academic officers are really seeing the value of personalized learning and putting uh, resources and support there. That's certainly the case at our campus. We've had a lot of support from our provost for our um, adaptive learning and personalized learning pilots. And I think for something that is as complex as uh, what adaptive learning is or can be at the course level but beyond, um, at a curricular level, and, and even um, beyond departmental uh, curricula, I think there's opportunities there, but that really uh, require strong vision, leadership, and support from the highest levels. So I think um, for me, that's something that I'm happy to see at my campus, but I think that has to be consistent and ongoing. It's, it's going, you know, I don't think we're going to see the nirvana of personalized learning in the next year or two years. And I think it just requires a lot of work at all the levels of the university. Um, so for me, that's yep. the challenge, is keeping people engaged and energized around what we see as possible, but you just have to, you know, we have to keep doing the work to get there. Yeah, I'll second that by saying, we've started to, to work on a program level integration for personalized learning. We call it the BioSpine where we integrate all of the course material for all four years into an adaptive learning system. And we're hoping that that's going to take the student into a learning path that allows them to do remediation. If they forget something from first year, while they're in third year, they can go back in the system and it can also track their performance over time. So that's the next frontier for us. And regarding leadership, my experience is there are four levels of leadership that have to be aligned for any of these initiatives to succeed. One is at the faculty level. We find that the faculty team has to be on the same page. Uh, we often appoint a course coordinator to provide that leadership. That person is the glue that holds the faculty together. Um, the next layer is the departmental chair. If that person is not on board, then the whole thing will fall apart because they're the one that makes hiring and, and course assignment decisions. The next level is the dean level. If the dean doesn't understand why you're investing all this time and energy, then the performance and tenure review don't get rewarded for it and there's no real value and faculty will find something else to do. And the last level is at the provost level where that chief academic officer has to buy into the vision, actually has to set the vision for the whole institution that teaching and learning are core to our success. And if you can get all four levels aligned, then you've got a recipe for a successful program. Well said, I think this is a really good note um, to conclude our kind of um, preliminarily discussed uh, program with and move over to audience questions. And so, in shaping edu live sessions you know audience uh, members have the ability to to turn on their cameras their microphones of course i know a lot of great questions have already been asked and answered in the chat but this is a great time um audience members to ask your burning questions to the panelists or anything that that is still lingering or even share your own experiences Okay, if no, if no questions from the audience, I still would. I think, I think part of um, making personalized learning concrete is all about sharing and showcasing um, exemplars in various stages. And so if there's other folks on this call who are working on personalized learning initiatives, pilots, planning, um, let us know um, what you're working on. We'd love to hear from you.
All right. If yeah, not, I look at Alicia, Alicia's comment in the chat is a good one here. You know, there are a great many faculty who may not be resistant, but are largely unaware of the possibilities. I think this is about raising awareness, and we should feel like we have to be evangelical at times. I, I get faulted sometimes for being a little too evangelical about this, but you have to push the culture and you have to challenge people to think differently about what they're doing. So in, in the grand scheme of things, we are the leading edge of this transformation and we have to use every communication resource and every technique we can think of to promote it. Amen. You can, you can preach all you want to me. That sounds, that, that sounds like a really great approach. And going back through the comments, because there was somebody else who had a comment about, you know, the faculty time and the investment in faculty time. Um, and I think the most recent comment was, you know, helping faculty members understand and see the possibility. They have so many, um, so many demands on their time that I think it's up to uh, the folks who are on this call to, you know, share what we see and what is possible with personalized learning. And it, we're doing that at UNC Charlotte through um, through events, educational, informational events with our faculty members, through demonstrations, through uh, having our instructional design team reach out to faculty members and courses that we know would be strong, um, strong, uh, you know, potential uh, groups to, to work in and develop and explore personalized learning. We are certainly working with our undergraduate education um, and undergraduate college, which is our uh, first two years here, to identify courses that we think would be um, good, uh, good candidates for working with adaptive and personalized learning. There was a comment earlier on, I'm sorry, I can't remember who made it, but that a challenge that they faced at their institution was that they had a lot of um, uh, maybe part time and or adjunct instructors or, you know, the potential for turnover and some of their large and gateway courses. And um, so that it was hard to kind of rally the support, um, maybe both monetarily, but also just in terms of uh, personnel support to develop and deliver a course when maybe the instructor teaching it the next year would be different. And so we certainly um, see that here at UNC Charlotte and some of our courses. And so that's where speaking to Dale's point about having the strong leadership at the faculty and departmental level so that the, the planning, the, the documentation is in place so that the um, personalized learning goes beyond the individual faculty members ownership of it. It's not owned by an individual faculty member even though they have such uh, a valuable piece in the development of the course. Hope that made sense. I love the way that Dale saying that faculty love solving problems and this is clearly a complex one. You know, using their research skill to, to be innovative in terms of finding the teaching transformation, I think is a way to go. Uh, working in the research one institution, sometimes you feel faculty value research over teaching, and it's very difficult to convince them to invest time and attention to really think about uh, different teaching strategies because the, the incentive model is really based on their research. So this could be a great opportunity to really create a, uh, a way for faculty to see that as a research potential. So uh, thank you, Dale, for suggesting that. I'll finish with one story, an uplifting story. Six years ago, I started working with a research professor who had been teaching one course for 30 years, which was Introduction to Biology for Non-Majors. And he had lectured over 35,000 students. He was very proud of that. And he told me that the first time we met. And I said, Dave, we want to transform this now. We want to be able to get a higher success rate, lower withdrawal rate. Let's see if we can solve this problem. I worked with him for two years. We transformed the whole course. And he looks back now and he says, I wish I had known this 30 years ago because I would have never lectured. And I love that story because Dave now has taken that skill set that he developed and he's gone international and he goes to Mexico and Colombia and Peru and he teaches other faculty members how to do a flipped course model. 
And I think you can teach an old dog new tricks and you can be successful if you give the faculty a challenge that engages their intellect. Oh man, I, I, I love this. The idea that also the, the, the learners become the teachers in all of this too. Um, yeah. you know, once, once someone really gets it and they're excited about the outcomes, the ability for them to spread their, you know, not just the, the science and the approach, but to also spread their excitement about the results that they've experienced firsthand. Um, we're getting to the end of our hour here. And uh, Karina, our wonderful live sketcher, has been awfully quiet because she's been kind of crystallizing all this in the form of visuals. I'd love to get a final word from you, Karina, having brought this all together on your take on personalizing learning, what you've heard. Um, thanks, Sam. And uh, it's always a pleasure to listen in to these conversations and just um, hear the energy even through this virtual platform of all of the participants. And I haven't seen the chat, but I've seen it blinking. So it's so cool. Um, thanks everybody for your insights and ideas. Um, I feel like uh, there's still some, some challenges here, but since um, the last time that I really took a dive into talking and thinking about personalized learning, I feel like there's a lot more um, hope and strategies and actions and success stories around this and how it's been used um, in, in your institutions. And so it's, it's really cool, um, not only in this conversation, but some of our other Shaping EDU Live conversations, hearing how um, sometimes resistance from faculty is uh, solved by listening to them, thinking about what other challenges that they have, you know, needing to um, provide research to the university that doesn't allow for as much time to think creatively or le learn a new virtual teaching skill. So meeting them where they are, helping them um, define those clear objectives and um, really providing the support so that they can support their students. So um, thanks everybody. And um, that's not everything that was shared, but those are the things that are bubbling up for me right now. Well, this has been a spiritual experience with all the amens I'm throwing out there, but amen, Karina. I think <laughs> faculty voice is paramount, and in what I'm hearing, and, and I believe fiercely, integrating them into the process from day one or ground zero is key to the success of, of such initiatives. Um, I want to thank our panelists and our live sketcher so much, Heather, Megan, Dale, Karina. Thank you so much. Audience, you know, um, in, in the words of the Beatles and Sergeant Peppers, you're such a lovely audience. We'd love to take you home with us. All the questions and <laughs> the chat have been nothing short of inspiring. Let's keep it going in our online community. And I also just fielded, um, I want to field a question that was sent to me privately, privately about uh, the publicity of Shaping EDU versus the private nature of engaging with Shaping EDU. Shaping EDU is a completely open community that anyone can join. We emphasize individuals over affiliations. Our online community is open and it's free to register and it just takes a few seconds. The only aspect of Shaping EDU that isn't completely open and public is our annual unconference, which is invitation only. And the reasoning behind that is to keep the event intimately scaled, uh, to be able to have those deep discussions and delve deeper into the actions that need to happen. Um, that said, if you have any questions ever about Shaping EDU, the premise, the approach, you want to get involved, please reach out to me, sam.becker at asu.edu. I visit our website at shapingedu.asu.edu. I want to thank everyone again and wishing everyone the happiest of holidays, and I'll be disseminating this recording shortly. Thank you so much.